I am standing, standing. I am standing on the promises of God, my Savior's time. And in I am standing. I'm standing on the promises. Everybody is standing. Yes, I'm standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, yes, I'm standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. I am standing, standing, as I'm stand, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, I am standing. I am standing on the promises of God. I am standing, standing. Yes, I'm standing. I am standing on the promises of God. My Savior, standing. I am standing. I am standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout, and I'm singing. Standing on the promises of God, we are all standing. Standing, yes, yes, I'm standing. Yes, I'm standing on the promises of God. My Savior, standing, I'm standing. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear are sailed, by the living word of God I shall prevail. I am standing on the promises of God. Yes, I'm standing. Standing on the promises I now can see everybody listen. Standing on the promises I now can see perfect. Presage cleansing in the blood for me, standing in the liberty where Christ makes free, standing on the promises of God. Take that again. Standing on the promises I now can see perfect presage cleansing in his blood for me 
you standing in the liberty where Christ makes free standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing, standing. I am standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ. The Lord bound to him eternally by love strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I can not fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior, as my all in all. Standing on the promises of now, we're standing, 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 standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Yes, I'm standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Everybody standing. Standing. Yes, I'm standing. Standing on the promises of God. My Savior standing. Yes, I'm standing. I am standing on the promises of God. We are standing, standing, standing. There shall be showers of blessing. This is a promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above, showers of blessing. For the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again over the hills and the valleys. Sound. 
of abundant suffering. shall be shower so blessing send them upon us O Lord grant to us now refreshing come and now honor thy word Shower so blessing, showers a blessing we need. Mercy drops round us a falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that you day, day might fall. Now as to God we confessing. Now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us a falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing if we but trust and obey. There shall be seasons refreshing if we but let. This way, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need, mercy drops round us a falling, but for the showers we plead, mercy drops round us a falling, but for the showers we plead, mercy drops around us a falling. Amen. The showers will come in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful, wonderful morning. We thank you because you are here with us already. You are here before we came. You'll always be there. Lord, we pray that today you'll bless your people abundantly in Jesus' name. We pray that all that we need to make a success of ministry and to make progress in every area of our lives, you grant unto us in Jesus' name. Speak your word to your people. Your people are hearing. And let your people be the better for it in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can be seated. We come to another study in Titus. And this time now we're looking at his inspired word. 
We're taking one verse of scripture that we'll find in Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Take that again. But preach thou the things which befit sound doctrine. But speak thou the things which come out and which culminate and which will lead to sound doctrine. Speak thou the things which are suitable and the things which are fit and the things which align along with sound doctrine. But speak. Speak thou the things, the messages, the utterances, the declarations that will go along with, not contradict, but that will be in agreement, total agreement with sound doctrine. Here you'll understand that Paul the Apostle had been speaking to, uh, to Titus and they'll be telling him first about the church. And about the leadership in the church. Now he comes to the real ministry within the church. In this chapter 2. And you'll find he told Titus. You'll speak the message. You'll declare the message. You'll proclaim the message. You'll preach the message. And it will touch the men, the women, the young, the old, the servants, the masters. Will touch virtually everybody. When he said speak... That was speak. He used it in the sense of preaching. Speak it out. Declare it forcefully. Proclaim it convincingly. And preach it effectively. Sound doctrine. Preach God's inspired word. He said Titus to be able to fulfill the multiplicity of the calling that you have. And to, be to have evangelistic impact, you must preach the word. Not only that, Titus, to raise a spiritually healthy church. You must preach the word. Not only that, Titus, to restrain those false prophets and limit their influence, cut off their influence. You must preach sound doctrine to fulfill God's purpose for ministry. You must preach the word to establish new converts and to strengthen the believers so that there are no more children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Titus, you must preach the word and then to train, to equip, and to raise up a new generation of leaders. You must preach the word to make the church steadfast. In turbulent times, you must preach the word and then to encourage and to help those believers who are persecuted to have staying power, to be steady, grounded, and rooted in the doctrine that brings life and that increases that life unto spiritually abundant life. You must preach the word and to make the church so stable. So steadfast, so holy, so righteous, so uncompromising. Titus, preach the word. Speak. Speak thou the things that befit and become and that are suitable for sound doctrine to prepare God's people for the coming of Christ. To make the church rapturable. You must preach the word both in public declaration. And in private conversation, speak only the things that become, the things that are fitting for sound doctrine. Look at that verse again. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That word speak is in the present imperative. When it says something is in the present tense, that means it's for now. It's for today. When tomorrow comes, to, tomorrow will become today. It's for today. Every time in the present tense, you wake up in the morning 
and you remember there is a commission, a commandment, and there is something that is laid upon you, and you don't have to wonder what am I going to do today. You know, when you wake up, if you're going to be a successful man, you must have what you're going to do today, and you ought to make your ma up your mind that today I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. You know, if you wake up in the morning and you don't have anything you're going to do, you'll just be blowing or moving along with the wind. And then other people around you, they build the people that will to determine the direction of your life because you had no agenda. Because you had no agenda, this one wants you to go this direction. Why not? Since you didn't have any agenda. And this one wants you to go this other way during the day, midday. You go there because there wasn't any agenda. By the evening, this is what so and so wants you to do. Why not? There's no agenda. But you wake up in the morning. And you say, today, what is the bounding duty upon me? The unshakable responsibility that I have. What I must do today. And then you say, this is what to do. Then somebody comes and he says, can you do this? You compare it with your original goal. You had in the morning. You say, no, this one is irrelevant. This one is a non-essential. This one is unimportant. Compared with when I woke up in the morning, this is what I was to do. And you keep to that. That's how successful people succeed. Whether it's in business or in profession, or in the ministry, in the church, anything that you're going to do, you plan it ahead of time. And then you say, this morning, this is what you do. By the way, what you do on a Tuesday should link up with what you did on a Monday. By the way, what you do on a Wednesday should link up with what you did on Tuesday because at the beginning of the week, you said, this week, to contribute to the 52 weeks of the year, you have the annual goal. You have your goal where you want to reach in December. And every week, you want to say, what can I do this week that will move me forward and move along what I'm going to achieve in December? And then today, what am I going to do today that will contribute to the achievement and the fulfillment of what I'm supposed to do this week? And part of that, the most important, the most essential is the word. Speak the things that are befitting, that become sound doctrine. I said that word speak is in the present imperative. That means it conveys the idea of continuing persistence. It is a command. Titus was not to be intimidated by the number of the false prophets in Crete. He wasn't to be afraid of the fanatical zeal of those false prophets in the land. He was to boldly declare God's saving truth. He was to be as aggressive in preaching sound doctrine as the false teachers were in spreading their unwholesome doctrine. He was to be more zealous even in preaching God's inspired word than the false prophets were in teaching their damnable, damning error. In spite of the proliferation of commercial religious assemblies, he was to speak the things that become sound doctrine. And despite the multiplicity of churches devoid, devoted to error and devoted to falsehood, he was to affirm, he was to preach the word that has power to transform lives. And therefore, Paul the Apostle, speaking from experience, is faced them in Philippi, is being to Thessalonica, is being to Iconium, is being to all those places. And he saw that if you don't have any backbone, if you don't have anything within your heart, if you don't have a plan, a direction, a purpose, a goal, the things you see and the things you hear will make you forget the ministry and the important aspect of the ministry. You'll be torn here and there and your life will concentrate on non-essentials. And then the fear, the timidity, the, uh, the cowardice within will not allow you to stand upright and to say, this is the essential thing. And therefore, from experience, Paul was speaking unto Titus. He said, be not afraid, speak. Do not compromise, speak. 
Neither give up nor give in. Speak. Be bold in the evil day. Speak. For the sake of souls that may perish if you keep quiet. Speak. And because of the coming generation that are watching and they are looking up to the people who are on the stage today. Speak out. To rescue the perishing. Speak. That's what Paul the Apostle was telling uh, titles and was saying, but speak. By the way, uh, you know that if you really study uh, the word but, really shouldn't, it uh, should not be starting something. It shouldn't, uh, but is conjunction. Therefore, it shouldn't really start a sentence. But because it's in connection with chapter one, he has been saying, uh, you know, Titus, I am an apostle. I'm a servant, and that is by the commandment of God. And it's so that the faith of God's elect will be established. And it is so that the commandment of the Lord will come unto the people. There will be the acknowledging of the truth. And then because the Lord has raised me up for this, this is what he wants, he wants his church established. And you, my son, I left you there in Christ so that you can set things in order. Now these are the qualifications of the people that you're going to to choose you are going to appoint but you remember all those other false prophets there unruly and vain talkers and they have slow bellies they're like wild animals you must make sure that you silence them and then after he then has said but you see that's what but is connecting you back to chapter one and he's saying now to be able to do this effectively you cannot just appoint the leaders and then uh, hands off and say i'm now on vacation I've appointed leaders in every city, and I've done this in every church, and then I've silenced all those uh, false prophets. Now, I can go on sabbatical leave, I can go on vacation, now I can, you know, just, when you delegate, you have delegated everything now, you can abdicate. Now you can fold your hands. Now you can keep quiet. Now Paul the Apostle said, after you have done all that, but you now, I need to speak to you. You have a responsibility that we have delegated, that we have trained, that we have equipped, that we have raised up other people. Doesn't mean now we're free. No, you still have to take your full load. You still have to do your work. Thank God for all those people who are there and are serving the Lord faithfully and effectively. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. We're talking about or we're looking into this morning his inspired word. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the command. Number two, the courage. Number three, the consequence. Number one, the command to speak God's inspired word. The command to speak God's inspired word. Number two, the courage to speak God's infallible word. The courage to speak God's infallible word. Number three, the consequence of speaking God's irresistible word. The consequence of speaking God's irresistible word. Now the command to speak God's inspired word. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. As you look at this whole chapter, you will see that Paul the Apostle directed him that he was to have ministry towards the aged men. And Titus, when you go to the aged men, speak the things which become sound doctrine. He was to also speak to the aged women, older women. And Titus, when you go to those aged women, older women, speak thou the things will become sound doctrine. He was to speak to the younger women and teach the older women to teach the younger women. Among those younger women, 
teach sound doctrine. He was to also tell those young men. And among those young men, growing men, speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. And then he was to speak to the civil servants. To the servants of those days, the employees of those days, and Titus, when you go there, don't get involved with labor union uh, standards, labor union activist understanding. Don't go there and be talking about the ethics of profession. When you go there, Titus, anybody you go to among those servants, civil servants, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine is telling us that whatever group we go to and whatever group we're reaching and whatever section of society we're talking to speak thou the things which become sound doctrine isn't that the concentration we should encourage also in our hearts that when you're in the children's section, you're not entertaining children. Speak down the things that become sound doctrine. When you're among the teenagers, the youth, the secondary school, high school, the students, speak down the things and that befit sound doctrine. When you go to those university students, you're not a kind of just motivating them how you pass your exam. What if we pass our exams and we don't get to heaven? What if we pass our exams we don't know anything about holiness? What if we pass our exams we don't know anything about Christian comportment? Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And when you go to, you know, those women in the women ministry, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You go to the villages anywhere you are, the things which become sound doctrine. Of course, when you come into the church for your Sunday service, for the Bible study, for the revival hour, for any program, and leading the workers and raising up those people, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine doctrine. Titus was not only commissioned, it was commanded and it was to speak and to preach. No other activity however important, no other activity however significant can be, can be an acceptable substitute. We cannot say we're busy doing this now therefore we cannot speak. There's, there's no time for preaching now. And this is the, the agenda for the day and for the time and for this period. This is the thing to do. There's nothing like that. There is no acceptable substitute. Every time, everywhere, at every opportunity, other things might have to go. Other things might be suspended. Other things may not be put in place. But if there is any one thing that is to be done, if there is time for only one thing, it is for the speaking of sound doctrine to study. It's a necessary discipline, but I tell us, don't just bury yourself in study. Speak. Preach the word. To develop yourself might be a worthy goal, but you must not stop preaching. You must still preach to raise a family. I've just got some children. And because of these children, raising children, this is a greatest. Yes, I understand. To raise a family and provide for the family cannot be neglected, but preach. You still must preach to pray and have a deep private devotional life. It's desirable. You know, there are people that eh, all the time, yeah, I want to develop myself. I want to pray. I want to have a devotional life. I don't want to do anything without praying. That's great. That's wonderful. But in the midst of that, speak. The things which become sound doctrine to lead and to organize is indispensable. You cannot have a church like this so large and not have some administration, organization. That's indispensable. All the same in the midst of it all. Preach, speak, speak the word to the congregation and speak the word to the individuals too. This command is as old as the early days of the Old Testament. The servants and the messengers of God were commanded to speak God's incorruptible word. Even when their audience breathed threats and hatred. That did not excuse them or release them from the responsibility. The command was not withdrawn. They were still to speak. You think about Isaac. Cry aloud and speak the word with conviction. Think about Jeremiah. 
he was to speak without fear even when his life was on the line his life was in danger threatened ezekiel was to speak boldly whether the people will hear or they will forbear here is here is another thing now uh, that preachers we need to remember the commandments you, you know some people say but you know i preach and preach and preach and the people have not changed so I'm not going to speak again. I'm not going to, you know, dwell on this doctrine, on these truths, on this emphasis anymore because the people are not listening. Ezekiel, God said, some of them will hear, some of them will not hear. Even if everybody does not hear, if everybody does not take it, or if anybody does not take it to heart, if you count one, two, three, out of a congregation of 300, all the 300, they said, we've made up our minds, we're not going to listen. All the same Ezekiel, whether they will hear or forbear, speak. You cannot say because they don't accept holiness, I will not preach holiness. It doesn't matter. You deliver your soul. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And that wicked man uh, he does not uh, repent, he will die. In his iniquity, but if you didn't tell them Ezekiel, their blood I will require at your hand. But Ezekiel, if you warn the wicked... And the wicked does not turn from his wicked way. I don't say, that's useless. I've wasted my time. No, you have not wasted your time. You have saved yourself. You have protected yourself from eternal judgment. They will die in their sin. But now you have delivered yourself. That means then, whether they will hear or they will forbear, whether they will accept or reject, speak. That's what it. Paul was telling Titus, and that's what this verse in Titus chapter 2 is telling us. Don't look at the people. Look at the master who sent you. Look at the Lord who commissioned you and has given you a work to do that they will not accept. That's not your problem. That's their responsibility. Speak the word. The things that become sound doctrine. That's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us that all prophets that were sent to preach and to speak, they were not to fear the faces of the people. And as you look at the New Testament, there are many wonderful ministries in the New Testament. But the preaching of the word was central, was the indispensable work. There are many commandments in the New Testament, but the command to speak, the command to preach stands out clear, high, above all the other commandments. This commandment is extensive and universal. The commandment is no longer limited to some a few prophets and a few apostles. Now we are commanded to speak. In the New Testament, there was persecution. In the New Testament, there was imprisonment. In the New Testament, there was suffering. In the New Testament, poverty, antagonism, violent opposition. What all those things were there by the authorities of the time. All those things were common, but Preaching continued in the midst of them all. After being beaten, the apostles continued to preach. After being chased and scattered away from their homes and houses, the apostles continued to preach. As they were scattered everywhere, they continued to preach. And we must speak. It's a task that must be done. Preach the word. Preach God's inspired word. Preach sound doctrine. Listen. Disobedience to this command renders obedience to all other areas and to all other commandments incomplete. Disobedience to this command to speak, to preach, to raise your voice, to declare the truth. Disobedience to this command renders obedience to all other commands incomplete therefore speak we're looking at deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 27 deuteronomy i'm reading from chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 27 the children of Israel, they told Moses, Go thou near, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. 
go thou near. You must have time of fellowship with the Lord. Time when you receive fresh from the Lord. Time when you just, you have to lock up yourself sometimes. And then you hear the word from the Lord. And then you read from the scriptures. It says, go near. And hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. Don't take anything back. Don't say, this one they will not accept. This one, they'll persecute me for this. This one, they'll misunderstand me for this. This one, they'll put some pressure on me for this. Uh -uh, I can't say that this is not the time. Speak out. All that the Lord our God shall say unto thee. And we will hear it and do it. We'll do it in Jesus' name. Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. That was, uh, that was um, Jeremiah. Say not, I'm a child. Maybe you are not saying what Jeremiah said. What you are saying is, I am illiterate. And the Lord is saying, Say not, I'm an illiterate. Or maybe you're saying, I have my own personal problems. And even everybody knows about my family problem. And because of that, I cannot speak. Say not, you have a family problem. Speak! You know that you have to teach the whole truth of the word of God. And many of you are here. You, you are here before I got married. You are here when I was a bachelor. But I spoke. I went to uh, 1972. I was uh, going to uh, Nogon because we had. Uh, I was to go for scripture union work, but then uh, the person who was supposed to pick me from Benin on my way to Nogon, he just forgot and then went his way. And then I had to stay in Benin City. When I stayed in Benin City, then I had to, you know, identify with a particular church there because my friend at that time, there was no accommodation. And my friend, uh, you know, was in a particular accommodation there. So I went there. And um, so I ended up, uh, you know, with uh, a particular bishop is going to glory now. And uh, so we stayed there. And I was quiet. I, you know, I was not married, just, just a bachelor. But I knew the word of a deeper life and not even started 1972 and uh, so I went to church with them I saw everything that they were doing and eventually uh, their um, overseer their leader said can you allow this uh, you know young man to speak in an, one of the evening meetings and the other pe the person said that's uh, for those of you from Benin that's uh, uh, J.B. Coker Bishop J.B. Coker is now he's dead he's gone to glory now Church of God mission and uh, so J.B. Coker said what will he say the man is so quiet we don't know whether he knows anything and then I you know I then you know spoke in one of the meetings and um, you know their top level man Bishop Idausa then came out and said from what you heard tonight if you know that you want to give your life to the Lord from what you heard you know come out here about 98 percent of the church came out don't clap your hand let's let's preach and you know they knelt and they prayed and then it also said please can you continue with us for this whole week and I said that's all right and every night we had great meeting calling people he said now on Sunday and they advertised on Sunday in their Bible school at that time was an American Amer that American with his wife they were holding their Bible school 1972 on Sunday they brought all these people together I wasn't married that's the point I'm coming to and uh, so they said I should speak and I decided I was going to speak on the Christian family. And I went from Genesis, Revelation, just, just all the Bible verses and everything and talked about the family. And those who are crying, were crying. Those who are repenting, were repenting. Those who are you're kind of, uh, you know, relating and reconnecting with their wives. Everybody did, did. It was a message that moved them. And then the man that is the person who was in charge of that Bible school, the American, he came to me and said, looks like you are not married. I said, you are right. I'm not. How come you know all this? I've been married for years and all this. I didn't know. You see, even though you are not married, and even though this is there, this is there, declare the word. And you cannot say, Lord, I am not married yet. All the same, speak. 
And we're going to speak in Jesus' name. And all the places I go, I don't have to say I'm a child, or I'm this, or I'm that, or I'm not this, I'm not that. The word is there, and then the spirit of God is there. And you bring that word out, and the spirit and the scripture join together, combine together, sending the message into the heart of the people. They will turn to the Lord in Jesus' name. I need to tell you, as, as a result of that... You need to understand. And you need to understand the guiding and the leading of the Lord. As I was at that time, I wasn't even at the University of Lagos. I was still in the secondary school teaching. But it also became so much interested. And then he went to a connected uh, a professor here at the University of, uh, of uh, Benin. And then I just saw a letter from the university and said, please come over here and come and become a lecturer. No interview, nothing. Because they wanted me to become part of the Church of God mission. That a person that can teach like this, they had an evangelist, they had an apostle, they had this, they had this, but they were looking for somebody who can teach. And then, you know, they just wrote to me so I can come to Bini and be a lecturer there and without any application at all. And uh, so that, you know, I'll be in that church and be part of their leadership. And that time, there was no deeper life. There was nothing, nothing. And I wasn't doing anything in my church. My church, you know, just, I don't know what happened to them. Maybe they were afraid I was a graduate. These mathematicians could be eccentric. And therefore, you know, they, they just uh, left me there and all that. And, you know, I was just on, waiting on the Lord. And when I got, I didn't jump at that and say, Ha, ah, I've got this. I'm going to join a Church of God mission. That's, you know, they have their ministry. They have their vision and everything. But God wasn't calling me. And when they checked up from me later and just, Hi, about that. Did you get the letter? from Professor Yeah, I said, I got the letter. What are you doing about it? I said, there's no way there. I wasn't anything at that time. No single member of Deeper Life at that time. But I knew. I knew. But it is a long story what God has showed me. What God has showed me was going to happen. All this crowd that I see now, I'd seen it in the 70s. I'm not just seeing it for today. I'd seen it before. And the Lord said, wait, don't, don't, don't take any step. Don't go anywhere. Wait, I've shown you that crowd. Even the dress I was wearing in that revelation, I can, I st I can see still that dress. And, and so, when, when the Lord is calling you and is saying, this is where to be. Don't be in a hurry. I've not got this now. I've not got this now. And then something comes up. And then you grab that and you run. You may be climbing the wrong ladder. There's a ladder that is leaning against the wall. This is the place so want to be, there is something for you on that story building, the treasures that heaven has laid for you. But there is, there's no ladder there yet, but there's a ladder over here. And then the room at the top there is totally empty. And because there's a ladder, you start climbing the ladder. Then you get to the top of the ladder. When you get into that room, you see, I've been climbing the wrong ladder. Although I'm now higher on the ladder, but where I get to, there's nothing there. Maybe you'll see how to come Come down, go back over here until God gives a ladder over there. Then you climb the right ladder to the right place. And so the Lord is telling us, as he told Jeremiah, don't say I'm a child. Don't say I'm not married. Don't say I don't have a child. Don't say I'm an illiterate. Don't say I don't have money. Don't say I am poor. Don't say that people will not accept. Don't say that. But in verse 7, and it says, thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. The Lord has put his word in your mouth. You will preach that word. Verse 17, Thou therefore gather up thy loins. And arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces. Don't look at the faces of people sometimes. 
Those faces might be intimidating, but you know, think about what's behind the face, not just the face. You know, some people, they look strong and, you know, they can bully, but, you know, there's, there's nothing inside. It's all just noise and empty noise, and they might have a terrible face, and it's like a terrifying face that will make somebody afraid, but behind that face, there's really nothing. Everything is neutral. Everything Thing is weak, and therefore there's nothing they can do. And if you just turn, you'll be stronger than them. It says, Don't look at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. We will stand in Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. You can't rebuke and preach the word and then be shaking and be trembling and be fearful and be timid. Speak with all authority. Let no man despise thee. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick. And the dead that is appearing and his kingdom preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own laws shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. We'll do it in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number two. The courage to speak God's infallible word. Yes, it is courage. And that courage the Lord will give you. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou. But speak thou. Whatever others do, don't worry about that. Speak thou. Other people may compromise. Don't worry about that. Speak thou. Other people may emphasize this or this or that. Speak thou. Uh, have you noticed that in Africa at least, things change? I think all over the world, in the religious circle. And this particular time, the church in a nation, the church in a continent may be emphasizing casting out devils. And all the other churches, that's what everybody goes after. You know, in, in America too, in the 70s, and the Charismatics and the Pentecostals coughing out the demon, sneezing out the demons. And then in many of the churches, they'll bring buckets and bring tissue paper, and then they'll be coughing out all those things. By the end of the 70s, all that faded away. And then the shepherdship, the shepherding came on. You know, it's all this fart that comes up a decade after decade. And that, that means that, you know, the shepherding, you couldn't pray to God directly. You have to go through, you know, the wife has to go to the husband and, uh, to, you know, to approach God. And the children have to go through the parents to approach God. And the members of the church have to go through their leaders before they can go to God. It was almost like Catholicism was and Catholicism coming back. And all that went for some time. In the 90s, another fad came up again. And the same thing you find in Africa here. In the 70s, you know, eh, there was eh, something that was prevalent at that time. Then in the 80s, then another scene. You know, Franklin Hall came to Nigeria in the 70s. And everybody at that time is fasting for 14 days and 21 days and 40 days. And doing this and that. And wearing the same coat for three months and one year. And there will be no odor because of this power of God. Atomic power. That's what they called it at that time. And you know, all the fights coming and going deeper. life just remain like this just to preach the word. 
And he came to me and, he, you know, introduced all the books to me and he invited me, you know, they, and he met in a particular place and prayed and prophesied and fasted for many days. And then after fasting, they came to me and said, the Lord said, I said, wait a minute, before you come and tell me, the Lord said, you have to be very careful. He spoke to me before you came. And he said, all of us who have prayed, and now we come to tell you, everybody in the nation, all the believers have united together. And then they've got the apostle, they've got the prophet, they've got the evangelist, they've got, the, uh, they've got uh, all the others, but now it remains the teacher. And the Lord said, you are the one to complete the fivefold ministry. And that if you don't, then he said any, something negative. And then said the Lord sent us to you to come and put you right. And know that this is what to do. I said the Lord sent you to me so I can put you right. You are not to put me right. I'm the one to put you right. And I said this, this, and this. I don't normally tell people that I have prophetic ministry, but everything I say to those people, not one of them has failed. None, none of them is in the ministry now. All their ministry just failed. And I told them, and I told them. I told them, I said, you know, this one that you're doing, this is not the way. That is just a matter of time. All these things will evaporate. And that's exactly what has happened. And we need to be very careful that when the Lord says, this is what you do, stand by that and stay by that as the fires come and go, as the emphasis come and go. You stand by that same word, speak thou. The things which become sound doctrine. Many Bible characters were courageous without being conscious of their courage. Normally when you are courageous, you are not conscious of it. Like many other virtues received by grace and manifested for God's glory, the possessors of those virtues are usually not conscious of possessing them. Possessors of humility are not always conscious of being humble. Think of Moses before Pharaoh. He wasn't conscious, was courageous. Think of Samuel revealing the vision to Eli. He wasn't conscious, was courageous. Think about David before Goliath. He wasn't thinking, was courageous. Think about Elijah confronting Ahab. Or Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. They were not thinking, they were courageous. When you are courageous, you just act courageously. It just behave courageously. It just take your decisions courageously. You are not conscious of that courage, but you stand. They were courageous without stopping to check on the level of their boldness. Peter, before the council. Paul, before the kings and the Jews and the Gentiles. Stephen, in Jerusalem. And Philip, in Samaria. They all fulfilled their assigned task courageously. But they were not thinking about their courage. How courageous they were. We breathe best when we are not conscious of breathing. Once you become conscious of your breathing, uh, your breathing will become irregular. But when you are not conscious, you are just breathing and breathing. When you are asleep, it's when you breathe best. Because you are not conscious of it. If you are not conscious of your courage, and you just say, this is what you do. Stand up and do it. Don't think about the consequence. Don't think about what the people will do. Don't think about what you'll suffer. Actually, your thought about suffering makes you to suffer more than the things that make you to suffer. Think about that. The thoughts about suffering, about the price I will pay, about what it will, your imagination, about if I do this, if I go this way, if I take this turn, this is what they will do, this is what they will do, this is what they will do. Your thoughts about what you think the people will do in their reaction, those thoughts, they make you to suffer more than the things the people do to cause the suffering. That's the reason you don't even think about it. And just go your way and just do what you need to do. And whatever comes, say, I can take that. I can receive that. I can endure that. They've done more than that or the rest of the apostles. I can stand anything. Don't think about it. And moment by moment, don't abandon your responsibility just because of what might happen. When we abandon ourselves to our task 
and we focus our, ourselves on a responsibility, not being mindful of pain or pleasure, gain or loss, pain or fl flame or flood, praise or blame. Then we manifest courage without being conscious of courage. Courageous leaders do whatever they have to do in spite of how they feel internally. While concentrating on what they have to do, their fears leave and courage quietly takes possession of them. Pray and stand on God's promises. Commit yourselves in faithfulness to God. Care not for the cost and for the price you have to pay. Care not for the consequence of obeying God. Abandon, addict yourself to what you are called to do. Fear and cowardice will leave. Courage will take over. With faith, with conviction, with courage, you will speak. Forget yourself. Focus on your task. Speak. In Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But speak. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Jeremiah once again, verse, chapter 1, verse 17 to verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. Thou therefore get up thy loins and arise and speak unto, all that, unto them all that I command thee. All that I command thee, be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee be, be, before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city. I thought you will say, Amen. An iron pillar, brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah. Against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. You know, when you know the outcome of the battle before the battle even starts, it's like, you, you know, in those days uh, when you were still an unbeliever and you went to uh, cinema halls or you went to see all those uh, films. You know, sometimes uh, as an unbeliever, uh, there are some things they call horror films. That is, uh, you know, when you get you into the hall there and then you begin to see that you're horrified and then you're wondering what you know will be the outcome the end as you see this character and this character and this character and this happens and this happens it says you thinking what's going to be at the end and that, that unsettles you that makes you fearful that makes you a kind of unsure uncertain but a few times while just before the people who are in, because they have first session, then they come out and then they have second session. You are to attend the second session of that uh, film. But for the last 15 minutes of that uh, film, of the first session, you had come in, you had paid for the ticket. Instead of just hanging outside, you went inside. And then you saw the end. You didn't see everything that took place here, but you saw the very end. And then they came out, they went out, you know, went in to now sit down for the second session that you actually paid for. And as you see all those uh, things, all the horrors and all the terrors and all whatever is happening there, uh, you know, you are relaxed because already you've seen the end. And you know this is how it's going to end. And because you know this is how it's going to end, the little, little details that go along in the film does not bother you at all because you are, you are saying, yes, this is happening, but I know that's going to be the end. This is happening, now, but I know this is going to be the outcome, the same thing. When you know, although they will fight against you, but you know that you are going to overcome. And you know that they will be the losers. Because you have seen the end. All the events of the, of the week, of the various days, of the, all the isolated events, they don't bother you at all. Because you know already what the end will be. And it's because we're not thinking of that end. That's why we're bothered sometimes. Look at what is happening. Will not the church, you know, will not the church be destroyed? Will it not be scattered? What if this happens? What if this happens? If you know the end, they will fight against you. But they will not overcome. Then you'll be more than a conqueror. Whatever events are taking place in Jesus' name. 
and it shall fight against thee. But they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to deliver you. You are delivered already. In Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2. And I'm reading there from verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 2. Reading from verse 6. And thou son of man, be not afraid of them. You need to be courageous and speak. Be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words, though they be briars and thorns with thee. Be with thee. And thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Thou shalt speak my words unto them. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And then we come to chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 8. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces. You miss that? Yeah. I have made thy face strong against their faces. And thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint, have I made thy forehead Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go, get thee to them of the captivity, unto the children of thy people, speak unto them, and let them, and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. You see, that's the commission we're being given, and we're going to carry it out in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the consequence of speaking God's irresistible word. I'm sure Titus was not wondering. He was an experienced minister already. And had been a partner, a fellow worker, a brother, a son to Paul the apostle. And because of that, he knew what the outcome will be. But all the same, let's look at point number three, the consequence of speaking God's irresistible word. Titus chapter 2 verse 1, but speak thou. The things which become sound doctrine. He didn't have to wonder, if I do that, what will be the result? If I do that, what will be the gain, the profit to me, to the church, to Christ, to the kingdom, and to eternity? The command given to Titus was purposeful. That command was profitable. Good things happen when we speak God's inspired word. Infallible word, incorruptible word, irresistible word. What are the things that happen? When you speak God's word convincingly, with conviction, courageously, without compromising, what happens? What are the profitable things that result from speaking the word? One, sinners are convicted. Sinners are awakened. And sinners are led to repentance and to conversion. Two, backsliders are restored. Three, babes in Christ are fed and nurtured. Four, faith is made active in the heart. When we speak the word of God courageously, when we speak the word of God to God's people, the faith of God's people will become active and mighty and powerful. And then five, the sick are healed. The consequence of speaking the word of God. Number six, the afflicted and the oppressed are delivered and set free. Number seven, Christians grow in knowledge and Christians grow in grace. Number eight, hope 
becomes lively when you speak the word of God. Always speaking sound doctrine, sound word unto the people of God. And then number nine, love becomes active. Number ten, error is exposed. Number eleven, truth is brought to light. Number twelve, Christians are renewed. Number thirteen, the church is revived. Then number fourteen, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, through the knowledge of the truth you are speaking in uh, will make the people actually have a uh, produced fruit the fruit of the spirit number 15 power is impacted into the lives of the believers because you're speaking the truth unto them that's why it's so important when you look at the consequences of speaking that word that you will take on the word and speak thou the word of life eternal we will all do it together and let us see Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 28 and verse 29. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 28 and verse 29. The prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream if that's all you have. And he that has my word, let him speak my word and speak the word faithfully. What is chaff? So the wheat, says the Lord, is not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. And that's the consequence of speaking the word. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm reading from verse 1. Ezekiel 37. Reading from verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. And set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And he carried me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. If those dead bones, dry bones, scattered bones, if they're going to come back together and flesh is going to come upon them with all the muscles and the sinews, if the life is going to come back into them, if they're going to rise up as a mighty unconquerable army, we must speak the word. That's the consequence of speaking the word. And then it says in verse, in verse, um, in verse 4, again, he said unto me, prophesy. That means proclaim. That means cry aloud. That means speak out unto these, upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Great things begin to happen. When you tell those dry bones, dead bones, seared bones, hardened bones, hardened consciences, hear the word of the Lord. And that's what actually brings the victory. That's what brings the life. That's what brings the restoration. And then it says, thus says the Lord, the Lord, uh, the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I, I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put my breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. I prophesied, I proclaimed, I declared, I spoke, I preached as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, as I proclaimed, as I spoke, as I preached, as I declared the very mind of God, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up, up upon them. And the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Pray and plead unto the spirit of God. Prophesy, pray, plead, son of man. And say to the wind, to the spirit, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds. O breath and breathe upon this lane that they may live. So I prophesied. As I was commanded, as I was commanded, if you don't change anything, if you don't alter anything, if you don't modify anything, if you don't decrease anything, if you don't diminish from the word of God, 
from the command and the imperative that has given us and you do it as you have been commanded great resource will come i said great resource will come so i prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived our people will live and they stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army exceeding great army because of the word that was spoken unto them. Matthew chapter 8. I'm looking at verse 8. Matthew chapter 8 verse 8. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 8. Here is what the centurion said. The centurion answered and said. Lord. I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only. Speak the word only. Speak the word only. And my servant shall be healed. Speak the word. People in your place will be healed. They will be delivered. They will be saved. They will be set free. And the great power of the Lord will be manifested in your ministry. In Jesus name. And now you know when all the people were in Jerusalem. Think about that. All the people were in Jerusalem. All the apostles. All the believers. With the Stephen. And with Philip. With everybody. They thought it was only Peter and John that could manifest the power of God. And then you know Acts chapter 3. How Peter and John went to the temple and then silver and gold are buying on rise up and walk. I but Philip, no. They thought Philip didn't have a healing ministry. I but Stephen, who reckons with them because they are just to distribute food. I'm telling you, when we are all together, like we're together here now, if anybody is sick, Generally, they will refer them. They will want to come to me. And if you want to pray for them, they don't have confidence that, you know, that the power is already deposited in your hand because I'm here. But, you know, when we are scattered all abroad and you go to Samaria and I am not there, more than what happened in Jerusalem will happen in Samaria. But you see, when we're all together, and you know, even if they bring you and passing by, then they brought somebody to you and they said, You know, this person has a need. You say, Look at the GS. They, Excuse me, sir. I said, What's the matter? This person has this. And pray for him, sir. Please, please help us. Help us. You will not release nothing in your heart. But after this Congress, everywhere you go, I said, Everywhere you go. Because you see, when we're scattered here and there and there, what I do here in Jerusalem, you will do in Samaria. And you'll do in all the other places. Don't ever think you don't have the power. The power is there already. And just take responsibility and speak the word. And then pray and command all those, the consequences of speaking the word. All those consequences will be fulfilled in your ministry. Speak, preach the word. Hold not thy peace. Speak. Let nothing silence you. Speak. Let no one muzzle your mouth. Speak. Let no sin have dominion over you, thereby destroying your boldness. Speak. Let not your conscience reproach you. Speak. Let not sinners intimidate you. Speak. Look not for another place or another time to preach. Where you are now, speak. Start where you are. Stand firmly and preach without fear, without compromise. Speak and let the whole earth hear. As we scatter abroad to every place, the whole earth will hear. I said the whole earth will hear. In Isaiah chapter 34 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 34. Verse 1, come near, ye nations, to hear. Hacking, ye people, and all that is therein, the world and all things that are in it. Let the earth hear. Let the earth hear. The Lord is sending us out with his word. And he's saying that as we go to all the places, everywhere, 
the earth will hear in Jesus' name. You can mark it in your Bible. It's in the middle of that verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear and to hearken, ye people. Now let the earth hear. Will they hear? I said, will they hear? Through who? Stand up and tell the Lord. Let the earth hear. Let the earth hear. Let the earth hear. We're waiting. The earth is waiting. The nations are waiting. The people are waiting. And the Lord is challenging you and is saying, speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. This word of power, this word of authority, this word that saves, this word that grants faith, this word that brings lively hope, this word that prepares people for heaven, this word that links us in fellowship with the Almighty God. Speak, speak. Don't hold your peace. Don't be intimidated. Don't feel I'll do it another time in another place. Anywhere we have uh, the Lord has led us to send you. Speak. In the region, speak it out. In the state, speak it out. And anywhere, everywhere you go, speak it out. Speak the word. Speak the word. Souls will be saved. Sinners will be awakened. Believers will be strengthened. The church will become gracious and glorious and godly. Speak the word. The sick will be healed. Speak the word. The oppressed will be delivered. Speak the word. Don't follow after the facts and the fashions of the day. After the errors of the day. Don't follow after. All the erroneous, false emphasis of the day. You have the word, speak the word. It's a command. It's an imperative. And it goes from day to day. Don't let a day pass without you faithfully, loyally, Effectively speaking the word. Don't concentrate on non essentials. Don't allow non essentials to take center stage. Speak the word. In season and out of season. Commit yourself to this essential thing. Speaking the word, spreading the word, proclaiming the word, emphasizing the word. Speak the word. Speak thou the things which befit, which become, which are suitable for sound doctrine. Obey that command. Every time you appear in church, speak that word. Every time you counsel, speak that word. Every time you teach, say the scripture, speak that word. Every time you minister, speak that word. Every time you have opportunity, speak that word. Don't be afraid of the faces of the people you're speaking to. Don't be afraid of the actions and the reactions of the people you're speaking to. Speak the word. Don't even think about 
the pressure, the pain, the persecution, the terror, the wickedness, the reaction of the people. Don't even think about that. The suffering that may come as a result of speaking the word. Don't worry about that. Focus on what you are called on to do. Speak. Now the things which become sound doctrine. Be courageous. Don't be timid. Nobody is going to do anything to you that God does not permit. And he'll make your face to be like an adamant stone hardened against their faces. Give you courage in the inner man. Make you stand like a giant of faith. Courageous, bold, uncompromising, speaking the word, not diminishing anything from the word because of what the people will say, what they will do. Speak that word. Emphasize that word. Trust in the Lord. And commit yourself to this purposeful, profitable, eternally beneficial ministry. Speaking the word. Speak the word. This is the word of life. It's a word of righteousness. It's a word of truth. That's what you are to speak, what you are to preach, what you are to proclaim. Preach, preach, preach that word. Without fear, without favor, without compromise, without timidity, preach that word receive new strength from the Lord new unction from the Lord new anointing from the Lord new boldness from the Lord new courage from the Lord preach without looking back Let all the non-essentials go. Preach the word. Let all the non-essentials be trampled on the feet. Preach the word. This is a great commission. The Lord has put in your hand. Don't allow other things, non-essentials, unimportant things to take the place of the word. Preach the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this time. We bless your name for what you have done. Thank you for what you have reminded us of again. That we should speak this word with boldness but courage. Not looking back, not counting the cause, and not thinking about the pain or the pressure or the persecution. But Lord, we pray the heart and the mind, the courage, the conviction to preach this word, give to every one of us in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to put all the non-essentials behind us and to trample them on the feet and to stand on this unchanging commission and commandment you have given us to preach the word. We'll do it in Jesus' name. 
Lord, even when the faces of the people are hard and tough, even when it appears that uh, poisonous scorpions are all around, even when it appears the people are reacting negative ways, whether they will hear or forbear, O oh Lord, the, uh, the, the heart to fear you and to look up to you alone and to preach this word uncompromisingly, give to every one of us in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray in this new year, you'll help us to rearrange our agenda. If we have been giving time to unimportant things, non-essential things, so Lord, we pray that the, word, the preaching of the word will come to the top. Yes, we still have to do other things and do this and do that and do that. But Lord, we pray nothing will take the place of the word in Jesus' name. So that, Lord, sinners will be saved. Backsliders will be restored. Believers will be sanctified. The sick will be healed. They are, they are afflicted and they are oppressed. They will be delivered and they will be set free. And then believers will have the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives. They will they'll move on to evangelize and win souls. And Lord, we pray families will be touched and transformed when we preach the word in Jesus' name. The church will be cleansed. The church will be purged. The church will be be strong as we'll preach this on diluted word of God and then the children they will be enlightened. The youth also they will be filled with vigor vitality on the basis of the strength that the word gives them on the campuses also they will know their left from their right they will go the right direction they will be able to know that this is the word above all the philosophies and the scientific things they're learning they will put the word in the right place in Jesus' name, our families, the husbands and the wives, they will live right, be united. And then their children will be cooperating with them. And will have strong families, loving families. And then our leaders, the strength they ought to have. They will be able to have that, the boldness, the courage. When we members, when we're listening to that word, when the word becomes a central, the important thing in the church, then the membership in their place, the leadership in their place, everything working together harmoniously, this will be a strong church. This will be a pure church. This will be a, glo a glorious church. And this will be a church that is militant, moving out of the word of God and reaching out to the lives of other people. Do it for us this year, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, this is where we started. This is how we started. And as the years have come and gone, many things have almost taken the place of the word. Oh Lord, we are praying that you help us to go back to our roots. And then to put all those non-essentials where they belong. And then to put the less important things where they belong. And then to put the word of God. This unchanging word of God. This faithful word of God. Infallible word of God. To put it in the right place. And then for the whole church. The church in the village. The church in the city. The church in the town. The church on the campus. And the church everywhere. That the whole church will stand with united heart, united mind. On this unchanging word. In Jesus' name. And this year, great will be the power. Great will be the focus. And great will be the consequence, positive consequence of standing on this word, preaching this word in Jesus' name. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the loan. I just thank God for all his provision. I just Great.